Delia will be our subject matter expert representing you. And I know we're sitting between you and lunch, and we've got 30 minutes. We touched on quite a few of this a few times um, in all the presentations. So what we asked was, um, uh, we came up with a set of questions for our panelists, focused on articulations. Both of these institutions um, really are doing exceptional work in our region, and that's why we asked them here to share with you some of their best practices. Our first question is, how many articulations do you have and approximately how many students do you register and or receive credit in your articulations every year? So at Butte and Glen County and then the North Fork North uh, High Schools, we have about 175 uh, articulation elements and we register between 4,000 to 5,000 students a year and then 2,000 to 3,000 students receive credit. That just blew me away. <laughs> so at College of the Redwoods, we have about 60 agreements in place. And um, I have to say that one of our challenges is actually getting people to take advantage of that articulated credit. I think that over the last five years, we've only had about maybe 12 to 15 students that have taken advantage of it. And so I'm really interested in finding out why that is. And so I hope to learn some things from you guys today. So I'm here with the K-12 perspective. Prue is probably going to answer most of the questions, and every once in a while I may add a piece in. And I do have to say that one of the things without the coordinated effort between the K-12 and the community college level, none of it would be able to happen. And I wanted to add that at View College, we have only one dual enrolled program. So articulation agreements, we have so many because that's really what we lean on right now and what's worked effectively for us. But we are exploring where dual enrollment would be appropriate. Um, I don't believe we're looking at replacing any of our articulation agreements, just enhancing what we have to offer. Next question. Can you please give some examples of the articulation agreements that you have and which of your courses seem to be the most popular? We have an array of CG courses, like just as I said, we don't do academic um, articulation agreements, so right now we do CG courses, and most of our popular ones are welding, auto, animal science, photography, drafting, child development, multimedia, computer science, and horticulture, and welding, and um, auto, and child development seem to be our most popular one of the high schools. opportunity to articulate in any of our CTE courses again like Delia said we don't we don't do the academic ones either and the, what's really been kind of interesting about which ones are popular is that at first we had a couple of CIS um, courses that were the students were taking advantage of that articulated credit but I have to say that I believe that was mostly because of the high school teacher because she was following through and making sure that the, um, the process was followed and that the students filled out the correct paperwork and I would go out to the high school and help those students fill out that paperwork. That's kind of changed because that, that teacher's no longer teaching that class. Now what's happening is that um, uh, we actually have a course at Eureka Adult School, which is our HL110, which is like an um, introduction to health occupations course then that course, the teacher, every year, every, every time it's taught, she's making sure that the, those students are filling out the forms and getting them to me so that I can get them the articulated credit. And I think the biggest reason that that course has been really popular is because that course is a prerequisite to go into our LVN program. And so a lot of the other ones, we have those agreements, but the students, again, are not really taking advantage of them. And I, what Prue was just talking about, I was really struck when Mike O'Leary was speaking earlier about how we hold hands, hold hands, and then leave them off to do it on their own. And I think this is an example of that, where um, there's got to be that balance where we hold their hand part of the way, but then also, and I was hopeful hearing that perhaps that dual enrollment process starts to teach them the understanding of what do I have to do, what do I have to be responsible for to be able to succeed in college. So I think that's a really good example where it's faulty right now. 
Um, next, can you share what your process is for how a school or course can be articulated? Um, there's a flyer in your packet, portrait, uh, that says steps to articulate high school courses. Um, they're very easy to do if they follow through. So first step is to submit your course online, not syllabus, uh, to me. Then I turn that course online to our department chairs at the college and they approve or deny the course. And if it's approved, they will um, let me know what course that articulates at the college and then I create the articulation packet. Once we have an articulation packet, um, which consists of the signature page, our course outline, with the high school course outline, and the credit by exam with answer key, which is provided by the new college department. Um, most of the time, these exams are provided by us. Uh, if the high school wants to use theirs, so we'll have to be able to the college. And the multimedia and fine arts classes, they don't have final exams, so they do portfolios, so we use that as the clarify exam. So once we have the packet and it gets signed by the high schools and the college, then that is a fully articulated course. The students register through um, our two plus two enrollment cards, and once they get those, we generate rosters, which we turn them into the high schools. Uh, they provide grades for us at the end of the year. So even if they're semester-long classes or year-long classes, the grades are due June 30th, and they're entered on the new college transcript the summer following that year, and they're annotated as a by example. If it's a course is denied by the new college uh, department, usually they tell you why, what you're not meeting, so you can make the changes. And most of the time, the high schools, what I've noticed, is they try to meet the same um, outline that our course has. in your packet the um, brochure for articulation at college graduates as well as um, the poster that has been distributed to our high school so that they can see. And the process for us is that um, I actually bring the faculty together from the high school as well as our faculty together and they sit down and they talk face to face when they make that original um, articulation agreement. And they decide whether that those courses are the same and they're going to work or not right there and at that time when we meet in that workshop that's when we actually write out that articulation agreement I don't have a copy of an articulation agreement online but I do want to show you something that we've done I created a website to um, help mostly the counselors at the high schools and uh, right now we have in five different counties and also in Southern Oregon where we're doing it um, so if you if on our website it shows those courses that are articulated. So I'm looking at Eureka High School because we have quite a bit with them. And so you can see there is an entire list. And it also shows on here when those courses are going to, when those articulation agreements are going to expire. And I bring them back together again. And when we originally started doing this, we started doing it to where we were every year renewing them. And then after a while, we really discovered that that was really too often because the content wasn't really changing that often or that that often. So we um, start going to every two years. So we have them listed for the, for for the students. We tell who the professor is at the um, at the high school as well as who the professor is at the at the college, so that they know who to talk to about that. The other thing that we did as well is that we also created the programs of study for those um, courses. So um, it makes it easier for the high school counselor when they're talking to that high school student to say, okay, look, you have the possibility of taking an articulated course um, when you take this course. And so if the program study is all right there and it shows, and if there's an asterisk next to the course, it shows that that's the articulated course. And so that is a guide for those counselors at the high schools to be able to use that. 
I don't know if they're being used at, at the actual college level. I don't think that they are because counselors really don't talk to them about what they need to take in high school. So that is how it was developed and, and what's available for them. And then when it's time for the student, after they've completed the course, we have a process for them to receive the credit by exam. And so we've put that process right on to um, the website as well in a four-step process. So they create the articulation agreement, and then for the exam process, the student create it has to complete a CR application so that they become a student and have a student ID number. And then the high school teacher has to actually sign off because not every student in that class is going to meet the qualifications to actually finish. You're going to have some students that are going to be like, oh, I don't really care. I'm not going to really put the effort into the class. Or you're going to have other students that are going to be like, yes, I'm really interested. I really want to do this. And they'll put that effort in. And so the, teacher, the high school teacher signs off on that. They send it to me and then I work with our faculty and our dean to get those final signatures and then I send it to our um, records and admissions so that they can add it to the transcript. And, then, and so the form, I'm going to show you the form that we are using for that. And right in this form, it shows there's, there's three sections to it. And we ask that the high school fill out the first two sections and then I take care of the, the last section and I've also put a, um, the directions for them as well. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> so that is basically the process for a student to receive um, the articulated credit. Yeah. I, so I didn't add um, what was on the college um, transcript. The students, most of the classes, they need to receive uh, a B in the class and a 70% or higher on their credit by exam, unless it's well thing and they go 75% or higher. So I, I'm not sure I'd like to add that the, the credit by exam is different for each of those um, articulated courses. Some of the courses, like for example, in our construction technology program, our faculty has actually given the um, final exam to the high school so that they can administer it to the students so that it is equal. Um, in our digital media um, program, and it's actual a portfolio that is reviewed by our faculty for that. So it is different. It's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis for each um, course. And just like dual enrollment is different at every college, articulation has some nuances as well. At U College, if you receive that 70-ish percent or better, and you're better on the exam, you're automatically given that credit as long as you've enrolled as a student. And at other schools, there are policies where you have to take you have to take a course at the college prior to that articulated course being put on your transcript. So there there are nuances and, and differences at each school that does articulation. Yes, I'd like to piggyback on that just a little bit. So, so um, for us, there's that nuance as well. So we require, require the student to enroll in at least one course before we will put the um, articulated course onto the transcript. That was changed uh, about a year and a half ago, where we used to require 12 units. And so I'm really glad that was removed, and that was a barrier that, that the students no longer have to try and jump over, which is really great. Um, but it is put on the transcript as credit by exam, and I know that earlier um, a question was asked about, well, how, is that something that the hype that the CSUs and the UCs will take? And it's really on a institution decision. You know, one college may say, sure, we'll take that, but I have also been told by other colleges, we do not take any credit by exam at all. So that, that could be a challenge for a student if they've completed a course and then they think it's going to transfer and it does not. And like I said, you, you automatically, the summer after you've taken the course, as long as you pass everything, receive that on your transcripts. And I'm thinking um, in the case of welding, that's especially important because uh, many of our welding uh, one and two at a, call, at a high school level articulates with our 20 and 21, which are both prerequisites to get into the welding program. So many of our high school juniors and seniors that have taken both of those articulated welding classes now before they even start college, we've met the prereqs to apply for the welding program. So with our Career Pathway Trust Grant, 
that is um, a nice carrot for those students that doesn't necessarily give them preferential enrollment, but it does put them two steps ahead of anyone else coming into the college wanting to apply for the welding program who hasn't taken those prereqs. And we're going to see that, I think, expand into our health, um, and especially into our health, and then possibly into our engineering and ICT pathways. Next question, any best practices that you would like to share? Well, one of our best practices is having biannual face-to-face meetings with our high school. So I put together meetings for each department, um, and I bring the high school faculty and our new college faculty together and want to discuss um, what is the best way to articulate the courses, and if they have any new articulation to bring on board. And just having that face-to-face -face meeting with them, I've noticed that over the years that it's been a great benefit to expanding our program. And um, another plus is having the department chairs and deans at that meeting, so the articulations, if they're ready to go, they can be signed on the spot, so I don't have to track them down a few months down the road, or are they? And um, no fees associated with this articulated courses, so they're free to the high school students. And um, I think we touched on this. Uh, grades are cut immediately on their transcript this summer after the, the course is taken. And most of these courses are introductory courses, introduction courses, courses, I can't. Introductory courses to the programs, and like Tessa said, it's a step back to the programs that they want to apply. Oh yes, we always feed the teachers at the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> like Tessa said, you feed them, they come. <laughs> so um, for us, it was ditto on everything she just said, but the other thing for, for one of the best practices for us is that, because I have Susie at the um, Hope County Office of Ed, that has been a really good resource for me because she helps me. It's very difficult sometimes for me to have the time to get out and talk to those high school teachers to say, hey, I need you to come to this. So Susie helps me a lot of times in getting those teachers to attend those articulation workshops so that we can make sure that we are continuing our discussions. And we have that with you, College as well. We have a site coordinator at each high school that I count on to get their teachers together. And another um, advantage was uh, doing substitute fees. So they would reimburse the sub cost. I think it was through the SB. Yeah, it was through the um, tech, prep CT tech prep, prep CT transition. So Prue was, instead of having them to have to come in an evening or a Saturday, was able to do it on a classroom day and then, and then reimburse their sub fees and fed them. And I have to say, one of the other best practices that I learned when I first started doing this was that everybody kept saying, oh, well, you've got to take this discipline and do it on one day, and this discipline and do it on another day. And I found out that really didn't work because what I discovered was that a lot of times at the high school, you'll have a teacher that is teaching in our, in our welding class, but they're also teaching in automotive, and so you've got that teacher in, in both areas. And so it was much easier to try and focus um, all of the disciplines together at the same time because then you could have them talk to our various different faculty and in, in our, at our college because we're pretty small, we oftentimes only have one faculty member per program and so it's a little difficult to, to continually ask that faculty member, oh I need you to come back three or four times for more workshops and it's easier to bring them all together at one time. The exception to that was agriculture because agriculture said to me, you know, we really can't do this in the fall, we have this FAA thing going on, we got this planting going on, we got all these other things going on. And I said, okay, what is the best time for you? And they said February. So that's when I've done the, the agriculture and the forestry and natural resources. I've taken them off by themselves, but the rest of them I'm doing all together at one time, and I found that to be so successful. And that's how we started at New College, but the more the program grew, the more complicated it got because we got have over 100 teachers coming from Pokin, so uh, that's when I started splitting the night department. And it's been working great, and I see more communication that way with our group when they're split than having a big major articulation dinner. So the moral of that story is you do what works for your area, <laughs> as in everything we talk about. Our last question is um, what challenges each of them face that make this um, difficult? And we would really actually, since we have so many K-12 partners in the room, if you have any solutions to these problems or suggestions, we wanna hear from you. So um, we're gonna end with this last question and then open it up to all of you 
really to get your suggestions on if you have any um, ideas on how we can uh, work around these challenges or if you have any additional questions. So what sort of challenges do you deal with today? Um, some of the challenges we face is returning those articulation agreements. They have to be signed, otherwise the students don't get the credit. And sometimes it takes a few months to get it back. Um, like I said, if we have all the key players in, at the meeting, it's easier because it gets signed on the spot. And then having the students slash teachers at the high school turn in, those are all on cards, so we can generate the rosters that and, at the end are turned in. And even sometimes we have those enrollment cards in, we don't get the grades, and then the student doesn't benefit from the program. And I usually get phone calls from the teachers, I mean, from the parents and the students saying, hey, I took this class at the high school, why is it all my transfer? So that's another challenge we face. And sometimes the student doesn't follow through and fill out the View College online application, you get an ID number. You don't have an ID number, no credit. So ditto for us for all of those things. Um, when we, when I first came to College of the Redwoods seven years ago, there were no agreements in place at all, and so it was really challenging getting it, getting it starting and, and building up some trust with the K-12 schools as well as between our, our between our faculty and building up trust on both sides and just really bringing them together and convincing them that this was a good thing to do. And once we got over that, we've been smooth sailing on getting the agreements um, kept in place and renewing them as we're supposed to. I have to say the biggest challenge that I am seeing right now is that the students are just not taking advantage of it, which is very disappointing to me. I mean, a lot of work has gone into creating this from everybody that's been involved, and I'd really like to see those students um, get that credit, so I really want to hear what is that barrier? Why are they not taking advantage of it? What can we do to make it more enticing to them? And I think too that um, that hurdle of not getting the students, I think part of it has to do with just integrating it throughout the course, the whole, the whole section long, that this is a part and this is an opportunity and what you two were talking about where you really presented as this is going to get you a leg up rather than it's just kind of tagged out there as this, oh, and by the way, you can do this extra thing. So I think as I think this whole workshop today is about is it's that whole integrating that feel and that culture of I'm moving forward to what's next after this time here at the high school and how can I be prepared for that? So I think that's a big piece of it is making it all smoothly integrated. And to answer that question at View College, I've noticed that our high school um, teachers have put it on their syllabus that it's a View College articulated course. So they, the students know from the beginning that this is going to be credited at View College. And then they substituted their final exam with our credit by exam, so the, the student doesn't have to take two exams at the end of the year, they can only take one. And then we also send letters out to the parents and the students towards the end of the year that says you were in the class and you will be receiving credit at college. Do you send We do. And I just wanted to add Delia's um, challenge that students don't sign up for View College, and so I, I think she said so you don't get credit. We get many phone calls, hi, I took this course five years ago, and now I have an ID. And Delia, as long as those instructors have turned in their rosters, Delia goes and digs through those files and, and enrolls those students, and they do get that credit. So as long as the instructor um, at the high school level has turned all that in four or five years down the line, we can still give them credit, but not without those rosters and those grades. And the rosters are not just the passing grades, they're for all grades. So if a student does come back to me and says, oh, I took the class and I passed it, I can say, no, you didn't. <laughs> so do any of you have any other suggestions on how we can increase? Put your hand up for me. And then with our piece um, in American American College always came out and enrolled the students in our computer lab, so that was very helpful. Got them their ID number and, and facilitated that for us. So that was a good thing. A lot of our, so well, a 
number of people. A lot of our high school counselors, they have taken that upon themselves and they register the students themselves. So that helps. The one course that I was giving um, a lot of students at the beginning in a CIS course, I, I went out and did that with them as well. My name is Jim Yant. I'm the principal of Bear River High School in Grass Valley. And I just have a suggestion for all the junior colleges that are involved. Having been a high school principal there in Grass Valley and see our kids sometimes go away to junior colleges, this is a great opportunity to let our kids know because we send a lot of kids to Butte, Sierra, uh, Feather River, right, that by for doing what they're doing in dual enrollment, that opens the possibilities to every single junior college representative in this room. So that's a cool thing, because a lot of our kids at Bear River go off to junior college. So that I think that's another magnet, at least for the kids at Bear River. I know one of the issues that we have at Durham High School, which is just four miles down the road from you, is that we have so many college prep kids. We are a very small high school, and a lot of our students can't get our articulated courses in because they're not A through G. So that's something that I have talked to our two instructors to see if we can beef up the, the courses we offer to not only have them be U College credit, but also to entice them a little bit. So that's something we've talked about. So uh, I know our um, humble ROP did, did a lot of that, get the A to G recognition, and a lot of the ROPs put a big effort into that. And also there is time in their schedules beyond the A to G's to take some of the other classes as well. You can get those, and then I think, um, to, you know, that's good to get those experience, the capstone classes and the elective classes that may not be A to G, but they're still a great life experience and can add to what you have in your ability toolkit. Any other questions? Uh, we, we are under the impression that be based on Title V, articulations is, is, is focused on CTE courses and not academic. That could be um, incorrect. As with dual enrollment, we have our own definitions of dual enrollment. Um, so, but when I asked that question at the statewide um, art, uh, middle schools and early college conference, someone said, yes, in fact, articulations should only be for CTE courses. So there is an understanding somewhere that that is a delineation And actually, dual enrollment for the student, I think, is actually easier. The course you get is the course that you get is the course that you get. Articulation, if you don't meet that 70% or better and that B, you get nothing. And a C's, what's the term? C's get degrees, I should. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it, you know, there, there's an advantage in some courses to having it be dual enrolled so that you still get. starving, so <laughs> All right, I'll pass it on to Amy to uh, okay. dismiss you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.